who knows what happened there, but it's it's ironic that the silver stockpiles of Shanghai went straight down from the, that day that Deutsche Bank was the first of the four banks to show up in second week in March. The inventories are down to their lowest level in years at just around 700 tons. So removal of counterparty risk, massive acquisition, doing so in a less than transparent way, it's exactly what's happening. And there will come a time where there is a, a delivery failure. And that's at some point when these exchanges become Bernie Madoff and price setting mechanism moves to the part of the world. Like the chairman of the Shanghai Gold Exchange said in 2015, that when we're allowed, when China's allowed to speak at the gold table, the real price of gold will, will be determined or the real price will be revealed. They understand the new BRICS grain exchange. They said, look, we're the ones who produce and accumulate all of these commodities, but the price is set on COMEX. In today's video, we'll delve into the insights of Andy Sheckman, a renowned expert in precious metals and economics. Sheckman offers a compelling narrative on the global dynamics of gold accumulation, repatriation, and the shifting trust in Western financial institutions. His analysis highlights the strategic movements of central banks, the implications of counterparty risk, and the potential for a significant shift in the global financial landscape. Let's explore Sheckman's perspectives and what they could mean for the future of gold, silver, and the broader economic system. Andy Sheckman begins by discussing the persistent trend of gold repatriation by various countries, a phenomenon that started gaining significant attention around 2017. He recounts how the Bundesbank, Germany's central bank, made headlines by demanding the return of its gold reserves from foreign vaults, a process that took several years to complete. This move by Germany set a precedent leading other nations like Austria, Hungary, Turkey, Poland, and the Netherlands to follow suit. Sheckman emphasizes the magnitude of these actions by pointing out the substantial gold purchases and repatriations in recent years. For instance, India bought one and a half times more gold in the first four months of this year than it did in the entire previous year, while also repatriating 100 metric tons from the Bank of England. Similarly, countries such as Nigeria, South Africa, Algeria, Ghana, Senegal, Cameroon, and Saudi Arabia have been repatriating their gold from the New York Federal Reserve, underscoring a widespread move to reduce counterparty risk. According to Sheckman, the core of this trend lies in the removal of counterparty risk. Central banks and nations are increasingly wary of trusting their precious metals to foreign institutions. This mistrust is an indictment of the current financial system, indicating a lack of confidence in the ability of these institutions to safeguard and manage gold reserves effectively. He draws parallels with the infamous Bernie Madoff scandal, suggesting that the pristine image of Western financial institutions could be at risk if there's a failure to deliver on their gold commitments. Sheckman highlights the staggering volumes of gold and silver traded on platforms like the London Metals Exchange and the Comex, which often involve rehypothecation and leverage. The potential for a delivery failure in such a system is a looming threat that could shake the foundation of these markets. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more expert insights and analysis. When you talk about, it's not just, it's not just the accumulation of gold, right? And, and we go back to 2017 when the Bundesbank, the, they tried to get their gold back starting in like 2013 or 14. And in 2017, they made a huge stink about it publicly. They said, look, we want, we demand our gold back, send it back now, for goodness sake. And, and they, you know, this, it took them years. And shortly after that, we saw the Bank of Austria, Hungary, Turkey, Poland, the Czech National Bank, the Dutch National Bank. But this is something that's been going on and on and on. We saw just, just this year, the first four months of the year, India bought one and a half times the amount of gold that they bought all of last year, but at the same time, they repatriated 100 metric tons from the Bank of England, i.e. the London Bullion Metals Association. And then we saw a few months ago or a few weeks ago, Nigeria, South Africa, Algeria, Ghana, Senegal, uh, Cameroon, Algeria, I said that already, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. They all did the same thing from the New York Fed, i.e. the COMEX. So what you are seeing is the removal of counterparty risk. And I think that this is this is um, an indictment of of the whole system that we don't we don't trust you even enough to allow our metal to be held by these governments so that it can be easily traded on the two major hubs for now uh, of trading. And, you know, I talked a lot about this, you know, th this 
pattern that we've seen, uh, we're seeing of delivery off of Comex. A lot of people don't know that in 2015, uh, the CME Group, which is the Comex, created a contract, if you will, that allows for metal to be delivered. Bars will be bought in in on Comex and delivered in um, China to Brinks Hong Kong, which is a Comex facility. And when you realize that typically the, what's traded on Comex is 100 ounce gold bars, it's interesting they have a mini contract also that uses kilo bars. So five weeks ago, 243,054 ounces, divide that by 32.15, you'll get 7,560 kilo bars or $571 million worth of gold was delivered to Brinks Hong Kong. Why kilo bars? Well, that's what they trade on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. And over the last um, 75 days or so, um, we've seen demand increase over 200% on the Shanghai Gold Exchange. When combined with the Shanghai Futures Exchange, it is actually outpacing the volume done on COMEX. It's now the second most active futures market and gold and silver hub where the, gold, the, the Shanghai Gold Exchange is cash and carry. The Futures Exchange has is, is got futures, but the combined volume surpasses COMEX now. But here again, we just saw the June delivery contract uh, for gold there was, uh, let me just see, I, I think it was three, I want to say 3,000, how much left? Uh, there were 30,000 contracts in the June delivery contract delivered in gold here just recently, 30,000 at 100 ounces a piece. Was that 3 million ounces delivered? Where'd it go? Who's buying it? So when you talk about what's happening, we are seeing massive accumulation. We are seeing it being done in a less than transparent manner. And, and the common denominator is removal of counterparty risk. When you see all of these countries, including Saudi Arabia, remove their gold from, from the New York Fed and the Bank of England, when you see India for the first time since 1991 bring all their gold back from the Bank of England, um, it's an indictment to the West and the lack of, of trust counterparty risk and and this is a big deal it's every bit as big as the, as the rampant accumulation because these exchanges were considered pristine there will come a time it was like bernie madoff ran a good ship until he didn't you know everyone thought it was great to be with bernie he started the nasdaq so prominent so prestigious and then people said oh bernie i need some money back oops problem well what happens when there's a crack with one of these western banks that are rehypothecating a gazillion times where there's, you know, the London Metals Exchange claims they trade 20 million ounces of gold and 292 million ounces of silver per day. But they're admitting that those numbers are 10 times understated. So that's 2.9 billion ounces of silver and 200 million ounces of gold per day. That's all naked, right? So what happens when they there's a failure to deliver? That's what the whole idea was behind these banks showing up in, in Shanghai begging for help. Who knows what happened there, but it's it's ironic that the silver stockpiles of Shanghai went straight down from the, that day that Deutsche Bank was the first of the four banks to show up in second week in March. The inventories are down to their lowest level in years at just around 700 tons. So removal of counterparty risk, massive acquisition, doing so in a less than transparent way. It's exactly what's happening. And there will come a time where there is a, a delivery failure. And that's at some point when these exchanges become Bernie Madoff and price setting mechanism moves to the part of the world. Like the chairman of the Shanghai Gold Exchange said in 2015, that when we're allowed, when China is allowed to speak at the gold table, the real price of gold will, will be determined or the real price will be revealed. They understand the new BRICS grain exchange. They said, look, we're the ones who produce and accumulate all of these commodities, but the price is set on COMEX. Schechtman points out a significant development in gold trading dynamics, the increasing prominence of Eastern markets. He mentions the creation of a contract by the CME Group in 2015, allowing gold bought on COMEX to be delivered to Brinks Hong Kong, a COMEX facility. This shift is noteworthy because it aligns with the preferences of Eastern markets, particularly the Shanghai Gold Exchange, which trades gold in kilo bars rather than the typical 100-ounce bars used in Western markets. In recent months, the demand on the Shanghai Gold Exchange has surged, with combined volumes from the Shanghai Gold Exchange 
and the Shanghai Futures Exchange surpassing those of Comex. This trend signifies a growing shift towards eastern markets as the new hubs for gold trading, further eroding the dominance of Western financial institutions. Shekman argues that the current suppression of gold and silver prices by Western institutions has distorted the true value of these metals. He believes that once the price-setting mechanism shifts to eastern markets like Shanghai, the real prices of gold and silver will be revealed. This shift could lead to a significant revaluation of these precious metals, reflecting their true market value. And so whether you're talking about precious metals or base metals, you know, they just bought the LME, the London Metals Exchange, China did. They're playing the long game and we're not, and we're focused on the wrong things. But what they are doing is using any angle they can in price, in rhetoric. Yeah, we stopped buying for a while. Yeah, nonsense you did. We're just buying it, not telling you about it. And, and the price drops because that's what the banks want. And maybe they're trying to dig out and fool the managed money into one more time taking those short positions. I don't know. There will be a one last time, but there will come a time when Moscow, when Dubai, when Shanghai, when these exchanges take over for the West and, and provide real price setting where price discovery becomes real. None of us know what gold and silver really should be because of the Western suppression, which has destroyed the price discovery process for a long time. I believe this in my soul. And it gets frustrating when you see this, I get it. But take a step back. I mean, is the world getting any better? Or are they just, is the world just very, um, they're, they're, the world is doing all they can to keep everyone from understanding the truth. There's just not enough gold and silver. There's way too much money. And they don't want to let people in on their secret until it's too late. But if it weren't happening, why would the BIS reclassify gold as tier one? Why would the central banks buy it the way they did? Why would they repatriate it the way they did? And, and now you get talk of the new unit currency coming out of uh, the meetings in, in Russia that are indeed saying the head of the, uh, the BRICS New Development Bank said, yes, the new unit settlement currency We'll use Project M Bridge to transact local currencies with one another and settle in a, a, a basket of 60% currency, 40% gold, the only tier one asset that all these banks are buying. So if you think it's going to be smooth uh, the whole way up so these banks can quietly accumulate all of this metal, think twice. They don't want us to know what they're doing because we would crowd them out of their trade. So they're going to do all they can to misdirect. I think that's what this is on a big scale. I don't know who's behind it or or how deep it goes, but I would say to expect it to be transparent is, is, is foolish. He also highlights the strategic accumulation of gold by central banks, which is often done quietly to avoid disrupting the market. Shekman cites the example of the Bank for International Settlements biz reclassifying gold as a tier one asset, a move that underscores the importance of gold in the global financial system. The introduction of a new currency by the BRICS nations potentially backed by a combination of local currencies and gold, further indicates a move towards a more gold-centric financial system. For individual investors, Shekman offers a strategic perspective on investing in gold and silver. He acknowledges that while silver may offer greater short-term potential due to its undervaluation, gold's role as a Tier 1 reserve asset makes it a safer long-term bet. He suggests a two-pronged approach, buying silver initially and then converting to gold when the gold-silver ratio corrects to more favorable levels. Shekman underscores the importance of understanding the broader economic context and the strategic moves of central banks. He advises investors to be mindful of the potential for significant changes in the global financial system and to position themselves accordingly by holding physical precious metals. I've always been pretty consistent on that saying that if I had one trade to make and only one, it would be gold because it is the only other tier one reserve asset. I know people don't want to hear that. I would still simply say that silver is the most undervalued asset on the planet and it will do very, very, very well. I don't know. I don't know if it has the lasting power of gold. See, I think gold will be pegged to a new system, and never come back down. It will be, it will be pegged. Gold is held in central bank balance sheets in something called the gold revaluation account. They will revalue gold and tie it to a system. We've already been told it will be tied to the new BRICS currency. Silver and gold have a 90% correlation done again through all of history. As one goes, so too, so too does the other. I think silver is the, the trade of a, of, of a decade, of a generation, the value. 
but it won't be easy. And I think if, if I were being completely candid, when that ratio corrects anywhere into the forties, I start trading into gold. doesn't mean I'm, I'm, I'm not wholly bullish on silver. I am, but I think that there comes risk with it because you know, look, it's not like it's not being accumulated. India has bought 650 million ounces in the last two and a half years. That's 10 times the registered category or more uh, uh, on COMEX. The LBMA has 800 million ounces total, of which 500 belong to the, to the ETFs. That's double what they have to play with, 300 million, supposedly, if we believe them. But we know that they're trading between 200 million and 2.9 billion ounces of silver per day. So how much is real? Yeah, so I think that silver will do just fine. But if a genie came out of the bottle and said you get two trades, it would be buy silver and switch to gold when the ratio corrects. If they said one trade, I would probably buy gold, re even realizing that it does not have the value or the potential in any way, shape, or form that silver does. But that's a calculated speculation.